Okay, it's nine o'clock. Let's get started. Who's ready to work with APIs today? Yay! Last day of the conference. We are here and we've had a lot of fun getting to learn about DevOps. We've had a lot of fun getting to work with PowerShell and I hope that this is a fantastic end of the conference session for you. My name is Devin Rich and as you can see here, my handle is Xerix. It is not Xerix, it is not anything else, it's just Xerix. I mentioned that here on the front because that is my handle for everything, whether you're talking about GitHub or on Discord or email address, I'm Xerix at whatever you're talking about. So if you wanna to talk to me after the conference and you don't get a chance, find me something Xerix and there I'll be. First thing is first, we have these awesome sponsors that have helped make this conference a reality. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy having the opportunity to talk with a lot of people during this conference. And I know that we wouldn't be able to have this conference if they hadn't been donating their time and some of their uh, attention and energy. So thank you to the sponsors for this conference. First things first is you need to get out a computer and you need to go to our lab space. And I have that set up at summit.dcrich.net. Go there, create an account, open up PowerShell Core on your machine. If you don't have PowerShell Core, that's fine. Open up Windows PowerShell, I'm okay with that too. I'll just kind of heckle you back about it during the entirety of my presentation. So if you've got PowerShell Core, that's PowerShell version seven. Open it up. If you just have Windows PowerShell, that's fine too. While you do these steps, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So don't forget your password either. You're gonna want that, don't forget. Oh yeah, I gotta remind you, PowerShell Core. Have you heard about me saying PowerShell Core, not Windows PowerShell? Use PowerShell Core, P-W-S-H. That's the shorthand for PowerShell Core. Web commandlets are primarily what we're gonna be working with today, and they definitely prefer PowerShell Core. Go ahead. Can I go back to the slide with the URL on it? Yes, I can. You're very welcome. Summit.dcrich. .net. If you're just walking in, this is your step one. Open up a computer, go to summit.dcrich.net, create an account, and open up PowerShell Core on your machine. If you don't have Windows Power, or if you don't have PowerShell Core and you're stuck with Windows PowerShell, that's fine too. I will help you out. We'll get through this together. But the web commandlets, does everyone know what I mean by web commandlets? No, perfect. Web commandlets are the commandlets in PowerShell that are used when working with APIs. So there's two commandlets that I'm thinking of specifically. That's invoke web request and invoke rest method. And these commandlets have seen a lot of attention in PowerShell core, and they haven't seen any development in Windows PowerShell since when was the last release for 5.1, 2016? The web has changed a little bit since 2016. So there's a lot of improvements in PowerShell Core specifically towards these web command lists. You go look at the release notes for PowerShell 3 or 4 or uh, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5. They all talk about improvements to the web command lists, making things easier, making things faster, making things better. So using PowerShell Core is going to be a lot better. I asked Copilot what it thought of using Windows PowerShell to work with web commandlets and APIs, and it spit out some sad pandas. I might have told it to spit out sad pandas working with web commandlets, who knows, but either way, Copilot says don't use Windows PowerShell if you're working with APIs. It says use PowerShell Core. The big thing that I hope you get out of this presentation is an understanding of how to read different API documentations. That is the most important thing, honestly, that you will learn today, more than actually working with PowerShell. I got into PowerShell more than 10 years ago. I was using PowerShell 1.0 on Windows XP. I was installing it on computers because it wasn't bundled automatically. And from the very beginning of working with PowerShell, I saw the flexibility that it had working with objects and it was just so entrancing for me. I loved it. 
And ever since then, I have been using PowerShell just everywhere that I can. And whether I'm doing things at home or just doing ad hoc things, PowerShell has been fantastic. It's helped me so much in my job to be faster and to be able to produce amazing things. So that's why really I was like, hey, I wanna do a presentation about something heavy in PowerShell. And so here I've got all of my different socials. Again, this is a reminder, Xerix. So whether you're talking about GitHub or Slack or Twitter or Gmail, you just Xerix at, that's me. You'll find me, you see me on Discord. My, I've got Xerix or DR, that's my initials, Devin Rich. Some people call me the doctor of PowerShell, but really it's just my initials. I didn't pick that. Not pretentious, I promise. Uh, maybe, a little bit, no. Um, I have this picture of the blinding sun to remind myself to talk about where I come from, which is Phoenix. It is the land of the blinding sun. It is so blinding that our stoplights have extra stoplights down low on the side. It's because they know that it is the land of the blinding sun. We don't know why we live there, but we do. And so we compensate by adding extra stoplights everywhere. My wife and I moved there in 2022. She wanted to be close to her family. We've got four kids and we have a lot of fun together, but she's graciously kind enough to let me come to this conference all week, hang out with you, which has been fantastic. I'm also excited to go back home and hang out with her again. Outside of this conference, I recently just got my ham radio license this week. I got my official call sign yesterday, which is fantastic. I'm digging a pool and I'm designing a rappelling tower for my nieces and nephews to have fun on. So there's a little bit more about me. I am. It's a fantastic thing. Catch me in the hall after. I'll tell you all about it. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Why am I giving a talk on APIs? when we have modules. We don't always have modules. Is that the only reason why I'm talking about APIs? Also, how often have you had a module with a bug that doesn't actually interact with the API correctly? Isn't that frustrating? You put in an issue and what happens with it? Nothing, nothing happens with it. Oh no, what do I do? So. There's times where we really have to learn as a PowerShell community how to work with APIs directly and not be dependent upon our modules. But I was talking with, uh, it wasn't you, was it Mark? No, it was um, next to you. Um, at dinner last night, we were talking about using modules and what we do need to remember is if, it's, if there are modules, they've got coverage, use them. I'm not saying APIs are just magically better and you should always roll your own. If there's a module, it does what you want, please go for it. That sounds fantastic, that sounds fast, go for that. When you don't have a module that's working, when there's no module at all, then you need to be ready to go into the API land. There's so many times. Go ahead, ask your question. Um, so, I'm new to PowerShell, can you help me understand? I mean, can you give an example of a module? What is a module versus uh, I understand invoke web request and invoke web command is in command. Yeah. Is, aren't they modules? So those are commandlets that are provided by the standard library. Right. And what was that, Ben? Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, what are modules? Is invoke rest method, is invoke um, web request module? So those are part of the, the standard library in PowerShell. There's a lot of community modules made by people or made by companies that have, here's extra commandlets, extra functions, similar to invoke rest method that allow you to interact with web resources. And we've had that in some of the sessions this week where like um, Anthony from Pure shows, here's our module for working with our storage controllers. And here's how you can query all of the disks and the volumes and stuff. That's their module that interacts with their APIs so that you don't have to go and work with the API directly. So modules are built by the community primarily to interact with specific company resources. Some of them are created by companies. Sometimes they're just created by users who say, man, I just really wanted to work with my call center application. I just really wanted to work with my help desk software, but it was something that no one else had done. So I went ahead and wrote a module that wraps all of the API stuff and now everyone can use it, easily creating tickets, easily you know, auditing things that happen. Yep. 
Um, actually, Missy on, at the opening reception asked me, so why did you present this topic? Why did you submit this topic of working with APIs? And I gave her a completely honest answer to start, which was I wanted a free ticket. But there's more to it. The, the reality is, well, in addition to that, I want to help improve the PowerShell community. I want more people to be empowered, to be able to take advantage of when there's not a module, to be able to go and work with these APIs and not have to be like, well, there's not a module, I guess I can't do anything. Because when you're at work and you want to do something, you want to work with a new company, they don't have a PowerShell module, you can just say, oh, I can do that. I know how to work with APIs. Yeah, I'm not scared. I'll take care of that. And then your boss says, wow, you're fantastic. I want to give you more money. You're great. Do you like more money? Yeah, there we go. I like more money. That's what's happened for me, honestly. Like, because I've done work with APIs and just jumped in, that has helped me so much professionally. The other thing that I want to talk about with APIs here at the beginning is that they are a way of standardizing. We have APIs that follow common patterns, standards, conventions, whatever you want to call it. And that's very helpful because we like it when it's the same type of feeling working with APIs. So before I get to this, let's look at our results. I had everyone submit a little questionnaire. Hopefully it worked. Did everyone get an account created? Okay, if you didn't, you should have. I'm sorry. Um, and I clicked on the wrong thing. I'll probably do that throughout the entire time here. Demographics, let's try that. People are building things in PowerShell. That's fantastic to hear. Extending things, awesome. Learning, great. Experience level, oh, we got a lot of people that are confident working with APIs, great. Learning about APIs, you're in the right room. I'm very happy that you can find it. I wasn't sure because we were in room 404. I thought that it would just be one of those not found sort of issues, but I'm glad that you made it here. Just from my own experience, I wanted to hear about your environments. Of course, if you're in a very secret place, I know that you were just talking about a similar type of company that's not actually yours because you can't share and you're just guessing or picking a random answer, whatever. But interesting that most people here are hybrid and only a couple people have on-prem Active Directory. Okay, so from this, it looks like I should talk a little bit more about these API expected patterns. A method and an endpoint are very similar in API world to verb noun structure in PowerShell. With all of our command, let's follow verb noun structure. Get item. You have an action, you have a noun that you're interacting with. APIs, methods, and endpoints, you think the same thing. The method is stuff like get, or put, or post. And that's get to get something, put to replace something, post to create something. Very similar approach. Endpoints are the nouns that you're interacting with. Get customer. Post customer. I'm creating a new customer. There's a number of different methods and endpoints. Um, methods are actually a very standard part. Um, okay, aliases. Did I put that on my slide? I don't know. Invoke rest method has a built-in alias called IRM. I'm going to use IRM throughout here because I'm on the interactive terminal. I'm not programming very perfect things. So when you hear me say IRM, it's because I'm talking about invoke rest method. And in here, can everyone see this okay? Okay, perfect. We have the method parameter where I'm saying here's the verb I'm going to work with. And there are a number of different options. Today we're going to focus primarily around get, which is very simple, go and get, post, which is to create. Um, we might do a little bit with patch or put, but these are just standard parts of working with APIs, which is why the PowerShell team has put them in as standard options parameters for the method. Endpoints are created by the companies, by the people making the APIs. They say, here's the noun that you're gonna interact with, whether it's the customer or whether it's a location or an address, whatever it is, they create the endpoint 
but this method is a standard way of working with it. When you're working with APIs, you need a way to drill down further and provide extra information. That's where we start getting into these extra things, the path, the route, the query string, the headers. Should I go through those? Or should I just skip it and move on? I'll go through them, happy to. If I'm doing a, we'll say, get request, now invoke rest method, invoke web request, they have a default to get. So actually I don't even need to say method get, I can just skip it and say, okay, I'm gonna do invoke rest method, I'm gonna hit google.com, something like that, that's the URI indicator. And when I say, hey, I need to get something specific, maybe I need to get the address from, or maybe I'm gonna say get the customer, I really shouldn't use Google as my example because we know they're not gonna do anything useful, but whatever your company, whatever endpoint you're interacting with, you're gonna say, I need to get a customer, but you need a way to specify, well, which customer is it that you're trying to get if you're going specific? Using a path or route parameter, you'd say by name, and their name is Devin Rich, something like that. That's an example of using a path or a route parameter. And the nice thing with APIs is you have that flexibility that you can say, well, we accept name or we ex accept by ID, 10049, whatever it is. You can have multiple of these even potentially if there's a customer that belongs and you wanna have multiple different criteria, you can say, well, we're gonna do it by name with this and we're going to add the extra bit of by ID. Well, you wouldn't really need to if it's ID, that's unique, but name and maybe address. Okay, we're going to do both of these to get who the specific one is. Alternatively, you have putting parameters into query strings. That's just within here, adding a question mark and then specifying like a dictionary, a key value store of name. Ooh, I can't type. It is a morning time, equals Devin, maybe Devin Rich. This is how I can say, well, it's not part of the route, but it's still providing information on how to actually figure out who it is. And we can say and ID or address equals whatever. Can you tell there's a different color? You can see that okay? That's one of those things that gets funny in PowerShell. If I send this, it's gonna be like, well, you hit this ampersand and then you were running a command. I don't know what's going on. You need to be careful and enclose URIs in double quotes if you're running query strings that have ampersands, meaning multiple items in here. Now you can see that it's all nice and blue and it's just going to treat it as one specific thing. I can put in the address for whatever my address is and it works happy. It really doesn't matter whether you have the double quotes around it. If you're not doing query strings, this works just as fine as it without, but I figured I'd call that out. The other thing you can do is specify a header and you say, hey, I'm gonna add some of my detail within a custom header. And this all depends on what the API endpoint is looking for, whether it's looking for that route information, whether it's looking for the query string or whether it's looking for a custom header where maybe you say, you know what, we find the customer, because that's what we're looking for, and we have them specify a header of name equals Devin Rich. And they may add, okay, well, here's your extra things. You just add extra headers. Body content, that is just a standard part of using invoke web request or invoke rest method that you can specify and say, okay, here's what I'm gonna put in my body. Here's the stuff that I need to use. Typically, you don't use a body when you're doing a get request. Typically, you only use a body when you're actually working with a post or a put request or a patch request. That's where they say, I'm looking for data to come in and the body is where you're providing that and sending it along. And then the last thing to talk about with APIs is status codes. When they respond, they'll say, hey, here's the status code. This worked great, 200 or this did not work, 400, you gave us some bad data, or it blew up on our side, we don't know what happened, 500. These status codes, we'll go through that a lot more here in just a minute. 
And because all of my notes are here, we'll just go along. Okay. Have you attended any sessions about APIs that said APIs are like contracts? APIs are like standards. Or uh, Justin Grody talked about how pester testing is like a contract. We have these people talking about contracts, 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 having that expectation that you provide. But it's also one of those things where everyone does something different. You may say, well, there's a pattern, there's a feeling, but every company does APIs different. Some of them do a very bad job and they're just off the rails. But even within the good programming, you're going to have companies that just do things different philosophically. So the important part is you understand with API standards, there's not really any standards and I'm sorry. Hopefully that's something that you can work with. Hopefully that's something you get a lot of experience out of today to be able to work with. Hey look, it's time for a lab. Okay, first thing, let's go to our, let's see, do I need to make this bigger? Is that decently readable? Is that good? In the back, okay. All right, so from here, I have a link to documentation that I want you to click on and look at the first thing that we have coming up. You click on that and it'll take you over to Swagger Hub, which is a common place where companies will post their API references. They'll tell you everything about their API that you need to know. And this is just one flavor of presentation and we're gonna go through a couple different other flavors as well. But this is one that I created just for this lab. And so I have a live server running at summit.dcrich.net, which I'm sure you all already figured out. And it has some API endpoints. So we're gonna go through these different endpoints and hit them, talk about them. Hopefully everyone will be able to hit every single one of these. And if you're having issues, raise your hand, call it out, and let's go through it together. My goal here is to help you learn not to just get through my content. I really don't care about my content. My goal is to help you and to help you learn. So going through the first one, we can just click on it and we can see exactly what's in it. But you'll notice a few things standing out. First, it says, this is a get request. Oh, remember get, that method that we talked about? Get, what am I getting from the API? The dinosaur. When you have a good name, that makes it so much easier for people to consume your content. When you're someone like me who's trying to actually work with an API, you say, oh, okay, yeah, dinosaur. I'm going to get a dinosaur. That makes sense. So everyone go ahead and try running this command from PowerShell. Now, I'm delaying myself just a moment or two, giving you a chance to try and do it yourself first. See if you run into things. I'll also do it on here. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking, what I'm thinking through but I'm just giving you a quick moment and I'm not giving you that much time, so I'm going through it now. So I'm just gonna do invoke rest method and I'm going to hit https summit.dcrich.net slash api slash dinosaur. And that's the same thing that we saw here. You'll notice that it said, hey look, I've got these servers, summit.dcrich, and the endpoint is api slash dinosaur. What do you think is gonna happen if I run that? Well, nothing fancy, but you hit an endpoint. Is everyone on the same page? Anyone have issues running this first command? Okay, great. Um, one thing I'll call out is I'm using invoke rest method. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, why don't we use invoke web request? We can do invoke web request, we really can. And it doesn't really matter whether we do it like this with the full name or whether we use the alias IWR. Again, I can't type. Either one works. Whoa, that's a lot of text. What just happened? Well, I still see the same content, but there's all this other stuff here. That's where we're getting into the real meat of working with an API because it didn't just return the content. It returned, hey, here's the status code, 200. Description, okay as well as the content and also the headers. Here's everything that's happening behind the scenes that you want, may want to know about. Invoke rest method is pretty much just going to say, hey look, pull the stuff out of the content and that's what I wanna work with. It also will convert it from JSON since that's a common format 
automatically for you. And generally, that works pretty well for what we need. So throughout this, I will be working primarily with invoke rest method. Our next endpoint is not going to be this, it's going to be this. Is this the same thing? No. no, perfect. What's the difference between the first one and the second one? It's a post, perfect. This is a post, so we're going to change our method from get to post, and it doesn't specify anything about the request body. You'll see that it doesn't say, hey, tell us the dinosaur spec, so it must be that there's nothing to do with your body. That's a little bit of what I would call a bad design. Why am I creating something but not providing any input about what I'm creating? Well, I guess we'll just see. Method gets a little wrap around, but whatever. I'm gonna run post. Oh no, what happened? I got an error. They said that it's not ready. Hopefully less than 65 million more years. Okay, but they gave us an error and they gave us a custom error. That's a very important thing to remember that even though they gave us an error, it actually does follow a very standard approach. We can look at our errors, go check out the exception, and this is going to turn into a whole bunch of noise. Oh, not too bad. Okay, I've seen worse. This gives us a status code. Now we talked about 200, 400, 500. It gave us a status code but it still gave us a custom message coming back. When we're working with PowerShell and these APIs, we may say, hey, I need to handle different types of errors. I need to have this properly wrapped. And you're gonna say, well, in my try block, I'm going to have my code that I run, and this won't look super pretty, but we'll go like that. And I'm gonna have a catch block to handle, if there's an error, then what do I do about it? And you can do that same thing of, hey, this thing that happened that caused it, go look at the exception. And as I scroll through here, I can see exactly what happened. There's this message. If I need to pull that out, exception.message. And I can just say, spit that. Now it's something that I can work with. Something that I can say, okay, well, if the message was X, or I can say, if the status code from that exception, because we saw that up here as well, the, oh, the response dot status code. Okay, okay, exception dot response dot status code. Internal server error. Oh wait, I thought this was 500. Is it an internal server error or is it 500? PowerShell is objects. Yes is the answer. It is all of those things. You want to get the actual numerical value? Great, that's no problem. You can just say I want it as an integer. It'll give you the actual number as an integer. Perfect, you want it as the text? That's what it defaults to. That's just the enum that we have native in PowerShell, so if you've already worked with those, it's the same pattern. Let's move on to our next one. <coughs> Status code. Oh, hey look, we talked about this. We'll go through it a little bit more. This is a little playground for you. Uh, we'll just skip back here. Summit, API, status code. What do you think is going to happen? Oh no, it didn't like that. Why didn't it like that? It says it's not found. What's going on? Better check our API doc, right? What does it say about status code? Are there any examples here that don't specify a number? No, there's only numbers. This particular endpoint doesn't allow you just to hit the endpoint. It requires you to specify something in that route. Okay, well let's try again. Let's try it with a 200. Okay, great, worked fine. Let's try it with a 300, why not? What's 300? Oh, multiple choices, did you know that? I didn't know that, I just learned something right now. There's a lot of different status codes, so this is something that you can play around with right now and try out all sorts of different ones if you want to. 400, bad request, you did a bad job. This is just reflecting back the standard responses. So 500, Okay, internal server error. So play around with it. Find something that you like if you want to. 418 is a fun one. Should we look at that together? 418. <gasps> Unknown. Oh, no. What a bad server. It didn't respond with I'm a teapot. Blame the developer. Not me. Ooh, it is me. 
Oh. All right. Um, I do actually want to talk about another status code. And this is something that's new in PowerShell, I believe, 7.4. It's called 429, too many requests, and the retry after header. In PowerShell, invoke rest method has this really cool option to say, hey, when there is a problem, you can try again. And that's called our maximum retry count. You can say, hey, I want to try it again. If there's a problem, just try it again. But you also need to tell it how long to wait before it tries again. And retry interval sec is your parameter there. I say, hey, I've got any time there's a problem, that could just be a transient error that maybe the service is starting up, maybe there's an issue with the network, maybe there's a problem with Comcast somewhere right in the middle. Those are all valid reasons for why a request can fail. Maybe they had an issue on their server and you wanna say, hey, let's just try it again five seconds later. That's a great approach because PowerShell will now, rather than just say, well, I tried once and I gave up and I don't know, and you have to write all these extra try catches, you can just say, well, let's try it a few times first. Make sure that there really is a problem before I actually give up. You notice that this didn't respond immediately. It tried once, waited five seconds, and then it tried again and then gave us back that error. Okay, cool. But what does that have to do with 429? In PowerShell 7.4, they said, hey, if you're hitting 429 errors, which are rate limited, saying you are doing this too much, PowerShell actually pays attention to the header that comes back and says, well, you're telling me the retry after, which is whatever number of seconds, I'll just wait for that long and then I'll try again. So we can do the same thing. Okay, over here, rather than 418, I can switch it to 429. And this time when I run it, it didn't sit around for five seconds. It ran once, it got a different value back of retry after, and then it went ahead and retried then. So it's really nice when you're using PowerShell Core. Have you heard me talk about PowerShell Core is better than Windows PowerShell for web commands? That's because they have improvements like this that actually make it so that it's more easy to do the stuff that you wanna do. All right, let's move on. Ah, request, perfect. Here we are. We're going to do get API request. Now, if you're someone who likes to get ahead, are you already ahead of me? Ooh, should I check? Let's see here. Nope, 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 all right, everyone's going slow. Wow, surprising. All right, we'll get request. Now, this isn't going to be terribly surprising from the stuff that we've already been working on with invoke rest method. It's going to respond and it's going to actually, this endpoint gives you information back, pretty much the same stuff that you responded with originally, or what you sent originally. It's telling you, here's the URL you used, here's the method that you used, here's the body that you used, here are all the headers that you used, nothing too surprising. It also has the query string. We can do the same thing of, hey, I want this method, I wanna add a body, and I wanna send something like name equals, Devin, great, cool, I can send it, oh no, I didn't specify anything, oops, bad programmer, all right, let's do a post on that, perfect. Same sort of deal, it's gonna respond, hey look, here's the stuff, we did a post request, we did, my name is Devin, and it even specifies in the headers, the content type that I did was form URL encoded. That's one of the different types that we have. We'll go through those a little bit more here in a few minutes. But the main thing is you can see exactly what you're sending if you have something like this. We compare that to what we have over in the website when you're using a browser. You look at the request that you submit. Oh no, is the server gonna die? Or is it just my laptop? Just my laptop, great. We look at what comes back here on these headers this is actually quite a bit different than what we saw over here on this request. If I come and look at here and I do a select and expand into the headers, I'll see things like my user agent, Mozilla, 
Microsoft Windows PowerShell 7.4.1. I look at the user agent over here from the browser and I'll see something totally different. User agent, Mozilla Firefox, not PowerShell, right? That makes sense. But this also goes into other items like the accept headers. Accept headers are saying, here's the type of content that I'm expecting to get back. In the browser, they say, hey, look, I'm looking for HTML, I'm looking for XHTML, I'm looking for XML, maybe I'll accept images. They have this queue, the quality factor. Um, by default, it's one. Specify something lower, it'll say, hey, look, I'll take that too, but it's not my favorite. When you look at the stuff that comes back in PowerShell, you don't have any of that um, except header. If you want to say, here's what I'm looking to accept, you need to specify it yourself. You need to come over to your request and you need to say, here's the headers and I'm going to be accepting, oh, if you have to type accept correctly though, accept equals and I'll say, what do I like? Oh, I like application slash JSON. Cool, that's what I'm accepting. And then when we look back at these headers, there's going to be the accept and I'm looking for JSON. A lot of times in PowerShell, you're saying, hey, I want JSON. I just love JSON. What's the second best thing next to JSON? Any guesses? XML, right? XML is what we default to. Of, hey, if I don't get JSON, I just still want a machine structured language that I can work with XML. Well, if you're the one writing the code in PowerShell, you may say, you know what? If I don't get JSON, I just want HTML. I'd rather honestly have that than also having to deal with traversing XML. That's where you have the flexibility and say, okay, I'm going to accept JSON, that's my definite preference, but I'll also accept text slash HTML and I'll specify that my quality factor is 0 0.8. I either want JSON or you can give me HTML, but I definitely don't want XML. That's up to you as the consumer to figure out what you want. All right, let's go through our next one. What are we on? Oh, now we're in the user authentication. This is a very critical part. Has anyone ever used an HTTPS website? Oh good, there's one hand. Oh man, did the rest of you fall asleep? Oh man, we're in trouble, okay. Let's see here, can you do this without me? Has anyone already tried doing a user password? We got one, maybe one or two, let's see here. We'll check the status. Anyone trying it? No one yet. Maybe I just need to update, we'll see. Try it out real quick, look at the documentation for that user password, can you figure it out? I'll show you here in just a second, I promise. Look at the documentation. What do you see on using the user password? Does it say anything? Do you see anything helpful? I'll give you a hint. The answer is basic auth, right in the middle there. Basic auth is one of the three ways that we typically authenticate to APIs. Basic auth is username and password. When you're using basic auth, you're just saying, hey, here's my credentials. Please go and get me the data. If you're using PowerShell Core, this is really easy. If you're using Windows PowerShell, guess what my answer is? It's not as easy, and I'm sorry, and use PowerShell Core. When you're using PowerShell Core, it's really easy. Actually, I don't have an account. I need to go create one. Hold on here. Do I have an account? Maybe I do. It says Tony Soprano. I don't know what that, well. Let's see, maybe I do have an account. Did I create one? Nope, all right, I gotta create an account real quick. Sorry everyone, hold on. My name's Devin, nice to meet you. I'm gonna take Darth Vader and I'm gonna use a super secret password. Oh good, I'm presenting. I make APIs for fun because I'm presenting and we're hybrid, great. Okay, now I have an account. Come in here. I'm going to make sure I get the right endpoint. We see that specified. I need to hit API user underscore password. Okay, cool. API user password, oh, not caps lock. Does it matter? No, but does it look ugly? Yes. User password, 
If you're using PowerShell Core, and I'm doing PowerShell Core first because I like it more, I will show you Windows PowerShell in just a second. Authentication, I say I'm using basic auth and my credential. I can just specify I'm gonna use a credential. And since it's PowerShell and I can do the sub expression, I can just do get credential and I can put my credential straight into here. Okay, hi, my name is Devin. My super secret password is this. Uh oh, something bad happened. Not found. What was that? API, user password. Hmm. Do I remember my own password that I just created? Uh oh. Now I'm scared. What did I do wrong? Can other people log in? Can you guys log in? Okay. So it's just just me. Did it work later or is it still not working for you? All right, let's try creating another one. Maybe I'll just need to go a little bit simpler. You know, maybe I should have tested this API a little bit more before I released it to production. <laughs> that is crazy talk, you're right. Well, I do have, um, oh, I clicked the wrong button. There we go, hey, login, sign in. That one worked. All right, let's try that credential. You might have to try it again a uh, different time. I created another one. It looks like this hit a different host and boom. I was able to authenticate via basic authentication. Fantastic, woo! All right, if you're using Windows PowerShell, you can't do that. And I'm sorry. In Windows PowerShell, you have to convert to Base64 yourself. PowerShell Core handles it for you, Windows PowerShell, it doesn't. So you need a little help. And I have a clipboard, and you can go and hit the clippy from the homepage to get to this same spot if you wanna do that. And I'm just gonna paste in here a little function called convert to, oh, if I can type convert to base64, I'll just put it in here. Okay, if you're looking at this, this is just a simple function. But Windows PowerShellers, you have to use this. The Windows PowerShell PowerShellers, you have to use this function to do the same thing. And I'll show that in Windows PowerShell. Great. Let me make it bigger, bigger, bigger. Is that legible? Yeah. Good? Okay. Same deal. Ooh. Let's try that again. No. We're going to hit user. Password, and we're going to say that I'm doing a header, and I'm going to specify that it is authorization equals, and now I have to build it myself. Like I said, you're gonna have to do it all yourself, which means you start with the word basic, and then you need to put in the base64 encoded string right here and end it and send that as your header. Well, this isn't gonna work because I didn't put in anything. First, I need that function for convert to base64. And this is a very, very common question on Stack Overflow, now chat GPT, of how do I convert to base64, authenticate basic auth, Windows PowerShell. Yeah, it's just this little deal. And you can see that it's nothing real fancy. Convert to base64. You've got your input text like this, and it's going to turn it into base64 for you. So you can do the same thing of, hey, I can just put it right in as a sub expression and I'm gonna convert to base64 and my input text, you know, it's the first parameter, I don't need to specify it. A, 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 same deal, boom. I've authenticated with basic, basic auth. Who here is using Windows PowerShell? Anyone We've got a couple people? There you go, did it work for you? Did you get authenticated for basic auth, Ben? All right, you'll get there, I believe you. I believe in you, how about that? Has anyone else done a basic auth yet? Let's see. Hey, we got some people. A Couple people have a few of them even. Good job. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I guess I can just click here, sort that way. 
I wonder who's going to have the most basic requests at the end of this meeting. Will it only be two or will it be more? Who knows? Okay, let's move on. Basic auth, great. Uh, user key, here we go. Is this the same thing? Does it look like the same thing? Does that look like base64? No, that looks totally different. It talks about an API key auth. It talks about an API key. Yeah, this is totally different from basic auth. You're right, this is different from basic auth. This is using a user key, and you have a user key if you can log in. If you can't log in, please try creating another account until you can. I'm sorry, that's what I had to do. Okay, great. So you have some API credentials that hopefully will also work. So come show your API key. Keep that secret, keep it safe. You don't wanna lose that. You don't wanna put it on a public repo or anything like that. Well, this one doesn't matter, but in the real world. This API key can go in any of those places that we talked about with parameters. Maybe they have it built where it's a path or a route parameter. Maybe they have it set as part of the query string. Maybe they have it as part of the headers. Maybe they have it as part of the body. It really is something that's just dependent upon what they do. Because like I said, this is the wild, wild west where anything goes. In this specific one, we've specified that the user key is a query string. It specifies here, query, query string. So we're going to need to do that same thing. And I'll come back to this PowerShell one. And if we look closely at the endpoint, it says we need to use user key. And I need to specify query string. There's our shortcut. Remember that we use the question mark and we specify API key equals, and I can paste it in. Now, oftentimes I say for development, sure, you can paste the API key in, but you don't want to be putting plain text stuff out on your console, right? You don't want that getting emitted out. So, you know, your best practices look for a way to make sure that that's not going into any of your logging, any of your security systems that you want it to not be there. You know, um, if you have a security mechanism that just tra transcripts all of the inputs and specifies that stuff, you say, well, I just, I will not post, I will not paste any of these keys. Maybe you do something like a sub expression, whatever. Anyway, you do that and you get authenticated via key auth. I'll give you a second while I drink because I can't talk anymore <coughs> to go ahead and try. <coughs> okay, has anyone done it? We got one, we got two, we got a couple. Let's see here. Anyone having problems? You can admit it. Oh no, what happened? <coughs> Someone figured out how to automate things. In PowerShell? Oh great. Good job, Alex Franklin, you're our winner. Well, we'll see if you're still winning when we get to the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we got a couple people here. Oh, there we go. We've got lots of requests, API key. Oh, you guys are doing great on API key. Okay, ready to move on? Great. Next one. The bearer token. Has anyone heard of bearer tokens? OAuth tokens, are they scary? They're scary if you find them in the forest, right? That is, you definitely don't want to find them in the forest. You don't want to leave them in the forest. You creating bearer tokens is not a good idea and putting them out on repos, but we're just using them today, so it's okay. I'm not specifically going to talk about how to get a bearer token because that's a bear in and of itself, but we're going to talk about using a bearer token. Any guesses on what you do? Go ahead. Can you explain a little bit about what, I mean, what is the difference between the API key and the token? Sure, the question is, can you explain a little of the difference between a regular user credential, a bearer token, and API key? So um, with basic auth, you're just using your credential. With API key, you're pretty much still using your credential just as a single form. With bearer auth, 
you're using a mechanism that allows you to delegate specific parts of your user credential for specific tasks. That's why everyone is moving towards using this style of uh, <coughs> authentication because it provides that way of saying, hey, you know what? I can just say you have access to email address, name, something like that, but nothing else. <coughs> oh, I do not normally talk this much. I'm going to have a hard time here. So let's try using our user bearer token. You can get that from your API cred, same as before. Go find it somewhere. If you're using PowerShell Core, this is going to be easy. <coughs> if you're using Windows PowerShell, it's actually going to be easy too. Not too bad. From here, we're going to hit the user. Double check ourselves. Yep, user bearer for bearer token auth. Bearer. And I'm going to specify my authentication scheme, and I'm going to say bearer, great. And I'm going to specify my token, and if I go paste that in, it's going to say something very angry at me. Because, any guesses? It's not a secure string. What does a secure string mean? Secure, it's not something that you're just allowed to paste onto the terminal. You need to get it as a secure string. Okay. Oh, can't type. Lots of ways that you can get a secure string, but <coughs> for the purpose of this, we'll just say read host as secure string. Paste it in. Look at that. Now I've got something. Secure string, okay. Let's come back up here. My token, yeah, I've got a token. That is a great security practice. I have my bearer token in encrypted protected memory. <coughs> that is much better than just pasting it in. So the bearer auth in PowerShell tries to help enforce those good standards, those good practices. Where possible, use bearer auth, it's awesome. If you're in Windows PowerShell, it's not quite so simple, but it's also not too bad. Authorization, and you're gonna say bearer, and it actually will just let you paste this in, I think. I actually haven't run this in a long time. Whew. Oh no, user password endpoint. That's not gonna work, is it? Look at that. Does that seem as secure? <laughs> Someone said yes. Who is that? I hope you're not on the security team or the PowerShell team or any teams really. That is not, that is not as secure. Don't do that. Okay. <clears throat> We're just about done here. We've got a couple more endpoints. Jeez. This is only supposed to take 20 minutes. All right. Let's do the account. Let's just look at it. Here we go, API, account. What happened? What do I have here? What do you get back? Any guesses? What? All the accounts, is that what that looks like? Looks like a status page. What, what does this look like? Oh, it looks like paging. Is that what you said? There we go, paging, that's the right answer. This is paging. This is an envelope where you're not just getting the data, you're getting extra information about the data. Look at this, we've got, uh, we've got 22. We've got 22 accounts on this system right now. But how many did we get back right now? Someone can read, right? Five, there we go, okay. So we got five, there are 22, and it's providing us some state data that helps make it easier. The next one is page two, believe it or not. We're on page one, we didn't specify anything. There is a page two. We go and look back at our account. It actually is going to specify, <coughs> oh no, the API doc doesn't say it, does it? 
It just has sort order. This is a bad API doc. It doesn't specify the page. It doesn't tell you how to get that at all. We're gonna to have to discover it ourselves. Well, I think I know the secret. Page equals two. Now what do we see? Do we get any more results? No, same number of results, but what's our next page? Page three. So when we are needing to get a lot of data, we want to take advantage of pagination in order to really get through it all. Because if you say, hey, I've got 35,000 accounts, and I need to get them, do you wanna try and do that all in one request? Is it likely to succeed? You might just say, hey, I'm just gonna get a thousand or two at a time, and then I'm going to follow the pagination. And there's a couple different ways that you can do it, but when they provide a next, it's actually pretty easy, right? You can just say, I'm gonna to go to the next page. And you can just keep following that through. Uh, if we go to, I think it's about page four, Okay, cool, page five, let's try page five. You get to the end, then what happens? No next. You just have, here's these things. Wait, what happened to the count? Well, we're just talking about regular JSON. It doesn't really matter. Maybe it's still there. It just came after. Yep, there it is. Count is still here. There is no next. So while next exists, go get next. When next doesn't exist, just stop we can create this same sort of an approach where we say, I need to get all the data out and I can just go something like, do the thing until I get all of the stuff out of it. Maybe I'll go do and I wanna get the response. I know that there's this envelope around it. So I know I just don't wanna get everything, but I wanna get the stuff out of the data. Okay, so I'm gonna go and get a response and I'm going to pull that from here. I don't want the format list, I'll just do this one. Yep, that looks really nice, except the page. I don't want it to be five, I want it to actually be dynamic. Okay, well, okay, all right, let's make a page, something like that. Page equals zero, yeah, that looks good, right? Then we can say, oh, well, page one is actually the right one. So we're gonna go with the page here, we're gonna start on page one. And we're not just going to say, well, I'm just gonna do the plus plus. You're not gonna do that. We're gonna follow that state. Where there's next, we're gonna use it. Okay, response equals this. It's a little bit hard to see. If I zoom out a little bit, maybe that makes it easier. Is that better? Seeing that we're saying, here's my query parameter page equals follow page. And then I can just update page. Well, I don't need to. I can actually just say, well, follow page. Uh, I can actually just say, let's do response. Let's do response.page. That's not gonna work because that gets seen as a, so there we go, sub expression, response.page is gonna give us what we like. Up here, using a one doesn't make sense. We'll just say null, we'll start it, we'll do the first one, it should work, and we'll be able to keep pulling until we get to the very end of it. But since we wanna get the data out, Let's just spit out the response dot data to the PowerShell pipeline. And that should get us honestly really where we want while we do a wow response dot next. Ooh, this isn't gonna work. I did response dot page up here. We know that it's called next, not page. Something like this is gonna say, I'm going to get all the data out and I'm going to do it chunks at a time. How many do we have in our array? Oh, I can't type still. Lots of things, array.count. I got all 22 by traversing five different pages. Does that make sense? Any questions on pagination? You've run into a bug before with what? A start record. Uh huh. And you specify the start record. But if you've got a fast moving data set of, let's say, a thousand items, if you get one through a hundred, that's not. <coughs> 
it may have actually incremented by one or incremented by two by adding another. Okay, perfect. So this bug is when you're trying to do pagination, if the data set is changing underneath you, that can be very frustrating to work with where it's saying, hey, just specify, I want the first 100, I want the first 200, I want the offset to be 100 or 200 at a time, and it changes underneath you in the meantime. How do you deal with that? The answer should be better ordering so that the data is not changing underneath you. If we ended up doing this with URID and read, we overlapped our reads so that we were always five before, so we had some things in the database twice, and then we did not unique. So your solution was, hey, we can just unique, so we can have some overlapping keys, and we can deal with it on our own. That's a perfectly good approach. Ideally, you'd say, hey, we can deal with some different ordering. Like, if this is going by the most recent down, and that's changing, maybe we can change our ordering and go by oldest first, and let it just be something that concatenates. That would be preferable, but do you always have the option of changing not the, no, not always. Oh man, we have so much more to talk about, and I'm running out of time. Go ahead. Sure. This works great, honestly, except what if they don't give us a single page number? What if they give us something else totally different? Now this is really nice, honestly, because you're just taking advantage of the PowerShell pipeline. You're sticking all the stuff into the array. You're not doing anything with bad array additions. Let's go look at a different API for a second. If you go Google, you don't have to, you can just watch mine if you want, but something like the Pokemon API, right? There's always gonna be an API for everything that you can find. The Poke API also uses pagination and they talk about it specifically in here. What is this? What is this API? Let's go to the reference. Do, 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 do. Where it is their reference? Check out the docs, there we go. Ah, reading is hard when you're presenting, I promise. Wrapper libraries, pagination, same sort of deal. And we can look at this as raw JSON or whatever. You see the same similar pattern of we have an envelope. Oh, that's not very readable. Let me make that bigger, I'm sorry. Is that, is that big enough for people to read? Same similar pattern. We've got a count, we've got a next, a previous. Results, they do a little bit different. But here on the next, they're giving you the whole thing. They're not just saying two, three, four. They're giving you the whole thing. So you have to say, okay, well, how do I change what I had here if I want to consume the Pokemon API? Okay, well, we got a couple different options. Something else will work here, but let's just try it out for a second. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. Pokemon's gonna be the best. Pokemon, oh, that's not very good on here. Let's scroll down. Pokemon, let's try that. Here we do. Now, do you see some of the same elements between this API and the other API that we were looking at? Get, here's the URI, here's the parameter if you wanna have a specific ID or a name. All the APIs that we look at, they all pretty much follow this same pattern of you have a method, you have an endpoint, you have some stuff to do, maybe you have examples of what you're going to get back on it. Okay, awesome. Let's go for it. Try running this just like that. Hey, look, they did a good job of documenting their API, much better than what I did. They specified you'd get a count and a next. They specified how to get the, the offset or the limit like you were talking about with specific numbers. Whether you're using pages or offset and limit, it's all kind of the same thing while also being totally dependent on whatever they feel like doing. So if we want to say, I want to get all 1,302, well, how many did I just get right now? Uh, I don't know. It looks like a couple. I guess I'll just have to look at it. Maybe response and response dot ooh, results dot count. How many did they give us? Oh, is that a very big surprise? I specified that I wanted 20. And they gave me 20. Oh, good. I love it when things work like that. Isn't that so nice? 
All right, going through 1300, we don't want to do it 20 at a time. That's a little bit too small. Let's do, um, okay. I didn't, you're right. Default, default is 20, thank you. They specify that the next page using the default, using what I previously submitted as 20, the next page is also gonna be 20. So they're giving me the whole URI. Well, I can just use that then. That sounds great actually. I can just say, well, you know, I've got mine, and let's go something bigger than 20. Let's say uh, limit, ooh, I did caps again. Limit equals 100. Are they gonna get angry? They didn't. Do we have 100 coming in? Yes, cool, great. I can do that same thing and just say, all right, here's my URI. I'm gonna get the first 100. Cool, and then I've gotta make sure I do a string so it's not angry. And say, while I have this URI, because it's gonna give me that same, it's gonna give me the URI on that next variable, I can just say, while I have the URI, just keep going through it. Same deal, array equals, and I'm gonna say, while URI, go do the thing. Okay, response equals IRM URI. Again, invoke rest method, IRM, same deal. Just easier to do while I'm here on the console. But if I'm taking this and I'm pasting it into VS Code or whatever I use, make sure that you expand the aliases. Am I gonna get the same 100 over and over again? So when they sent us a response, they said, here's the next page. I'm gonna take advantage of that. So I'm not using it yet, sorry. I'll put that in right now. Let's do that. So I'm gonna get the first response right now, <clears throat> and I'm gonna set the URI equal to response dot next. Then I can just take advantage of what they give me and roll it out. And of course, I wanna get the results back in, so I also need to kick out response dot results, something like that. This is great because I'm not having to do special array lists. I'm not having to do any of that stuff that adds extra processing. I'm just taking advantage of the regular PowerShell pipeline. And I, let's make it a little handier. Let's also show write host. Give us some nice diagnostics. No new line, let's sit a little something. Go run it. 1302 Pokemon. How many uh, page requests did we do here? So it looked like about 13, 14? Yeah, it just ran through all the Pokemon in the entire thing. How long did that take? One second? Something like that? That worked great. Well, did it? Let's see, I don't know. Array? Do we have something? Hey, we do have something. What's our count? 1,302. This is a great pattern for, I need to go and get stuff through the whole list. I'll just use the approach of following the state, the next, following the previous, whichever direction you need to go. I love it, I use that all the time. Okay, we're almost done looking at our API doc. Has anyone gone through the rest of our API doc? Have you found anything funny? I put a little bonus in here, there's one more. The Ron Swanson quotes, quotes. thank you for figuring them out. Are there any good ones that you found? One rage every three months is permitted. Beautiful. There's some good ones in there. I'm not gonna go through it, but whatever. Oh, what do we wanna talk about next? Oh, geez, only got 20 minutes. Um, what, you wanna talk about forms, session variables? You wanna talk about webhooks posting data to like Discord or Teams? What, what are you guys interested in? Cat facts? That wasn't one of my two options. You're the hecklers, you're out. Out, no, I'm just kidding, you can stay. You wanna talk about Discord? Let's try some webhooks, okay. If we want to look at Discord, and we wanna send some data to Discord, we need to use a webhook. And webhooks are really honestly pretty common. They're a lightweight approach to sending notifications to whatever system. So 
the point of this session isn't learn how to work with Discord. The point of this session is learn how to work with APIs. Let's dig into some APIs. API, Discord, oh, I keep hitting caps lock. API, Discord, documentation, something like that. Maybe I'll add webhooks because I know that I want webhook. Hey, look, webhook. Discord developer portal. As a non-developer, you gotta get used to going to the developer resources if you wanna work with APIs. You gotta learn to get used to working or reading in these types of deals. Webhook resource. Webhooks are a low effort way to post messages. Yeah, that's what I want. Here's a webhook object. It's got an ID or a type or a channel ID. Okay, cool. Well, I don't know. It's just one of those things you need to spend time working with these APIs, reading in them, getting used to how they do it. Um, this starts out with creating a webhook. We don't need to do that. Let's just use the API to execute. Execute a webhook. What do you see in here? Does this look pretty much the same as what we've seen with all of our other APIs? Post, URI. Oh, you can't even see that, can you? Nope, I made it worse. There we go, that's better. Post, URI, talks about warnings, 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 okay. But the good stuff, here's query string params, we know what those are. Here's JSON, form params, okay, great. We know what those are. Cool, we can just follow the same API to post to a webhook. Let's go create one real quick. Are there any elegant ways of handling expired access tokens? What do you mean by an expired access token? A webhook that doesn't exist, for example? So you remember that time that I said getting an access token in Bearer is out of the scope of this? Okay, I said it, I promise you were here and I maintain that position. That is out of the scope, so I'm not gonna talk about it at all. But yes, there are elegant ways to do that. Um, and really the best way to go is for you to look at the headers and say, when does it expire? Because they'll specify it expires time or it might be a snowflake potentially where it's, you can convert it to something that says, here's when it expires. So it just kind of depends on what specific application you're talking about, but they do typically um, either specify in the headers or they might respond specifically and say, hey, error 401, and then they give you a, like a JSON response saying, here's the reason why you got 401. Your access token is expired. So at that point, you would have to go back to like what we saw earlier with doing the error catch. You've got your try, you've got your catch, and you're gonna go look at that exception. You're gonna say, okay, what's my exception dot status message or exception dot message? And say, what is the actual response coming out of it? That's gonna be your programmatic approach. So you can automate, if I get status message, you know, the way that Discord likes to do it, which is, I think, very handy, um, is they specify there's status codes, but there's also JSON codes. Uh, Discord, uh, JSON, error codes, something like that. Let's see if that gets us to the right place. Okay, we're used to gateway opcodes, no. We're used to, is that really status, opcodes, status codes, HTTP, there we go. All right, we're used to HTTP response codes. These make sense, 200, 404, 500. But if they are saying 401, Discord will respond with a JSON error code as well in the status body. So you can convert the body from JSON and say, okay, What's my code? They'll specify a code node and they'll specify a meaning or a description. So you can be like, okay, parse the response, the error body response. It's 1,000 or 10,001, unknown account. So you're gonna have to just go find their documentation if they do a good job of writing it and be like, okay, if I get 10,001, I know I need to go and do this. That's how you automate it. Yep. Okay, back here, JSON, nope, not JSON, webhook. Let's do a webhook. We've got a little server, let's create a webhook real quick. Uh, webhooks, nope, let's do it on this channel. 
I'm going to let you guys post to this channel. I don't know what you're going to say, but hopefully it's very nice things. I created a webhook that's the Spidey Bot. Let's go paste that in to Clippy. So go open up Clippy, go pull this webhook, and try pasting, try posting some code or posting anything to this webhook. Do you know how to do it? Can you follow the API documentation for executing a webhook? Now you don't need to worry about webhook ID, you don't need to worry about webhook token, because I just gave those to you over here on Clippy. Everyone has Clippy? You all got it? Okay, right here. We've got this webhook. <clears throat> Look at that. There's our ID. Here's our token. Yeah, you don't need to worry about any of that part. You're just trying to post something to this webhook. And what do you post? Follow what it says here. It's got a nice JSON form parameter. So content or username, try one of those. Let's see if anyone's gonna be first. Should I be first? Is that even readable? Will we know if someone posts? Is that better? Yeah, that's better, okay. No one yet, all right. Well, I guess I'll start on it. Let's see here. I know it's IRM. I'm going to be sending it to this webhook and maybe I'll just put that in some quotes real quick. <clears throat> Great. Um, okay, I know that I need to do a method that's gonna be post. I know that I need to also send a body because I'm gonna post something. What do I, let's see here. Oh, okay, so it says I need a content field. All right, let's try that. Oh, still no one yet, all right. Maybe I will be first. Content equals, what content should I put in? Obviously, hello world, because I'm programming today. Did it work? Yo! Oh, someone beat me. Who was it? Is that you? There you go. We got someone. Yo, ABC123. <clears throat> was that very hard to post that webhook? Hello class. There we go. Was that hard? That was pretty easy. A little bit hard, a little scary? What do you think? Not too bad? We can go all up in here. We can say anything that we want, and since this is recorded, I'm just gonna state for the record that I am not liable for what you guys post um, because I don't wanna be on any lists. Um, we can just follow exactly what the API says, and we can put whatever we want. Okay, content, username. Well, I picked a username that was pretty cool. Darth Vader. Let's look at it. Oh yeah, yeah. All I did was follow the API doc. Now, my message is coming through as Darth Vader. The important part is, learn to follow the API doc and you can do whatever they have available. Awesome. Um, what do we want to dig into next? We've all, oh geez. We've got 12 minutes and I'm supposed to give you guys some time for Q&A. Oh man. Um, do you want to talk about multi-part forms, uploading files in along with messages to Discord? Do you want to talk about batching APIs? Do you want to talk about Microsoft Graph? Do you want to talk about, oh geez. Microsoft Graph? All right, let's go talk about Graph for a minute. So this is one of those times where I said, if there's a module, that's probably easier than rolling it yourself. I don't want you to waste time doing things that are already solved, okay? Everyone understands, use a module if it's better. There are environments where you're like, you know what, it's harder to have a module. I'm gonna work with the API directly. Cool, that's fine. Whatever works for you, go for it. But API, um, Graph, Explorer, Microsoft. Have you heard of the Graph Explorer? Hey, there's a Graph Explorer. This lets you explore all of the Graph APIs. Now, the Microsoft Graph module for PowerShell has a lot of these. It doesn't have all of them, but it has a lot of them. When you don't have them in the Microsoft module, 
you're going to want to come to like the Graph Explorer. This is a fantastic little playground where you can get to interact with these different endpoints. So you can do stuff like, well, I want to just look at my profile. Okay, run the query. If you are authenticated, which I did log in, so I have a valid, oh, I take that back. It gave me a sample. Here, let me log in real quick. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. That's a terrible idea. Right, hold on. We'll get there. Or maybe we won't, who knows. Log in, we'll try it one more time. If this takes more than seven seconds, I'm just giving up. All right, that actually worked. Oh, that's tiny. Oh, let's go bigger. Okay, yeah, I've got Nexus token. There's my bearer token. Uh, please don't steal that right now. <coughs> I'll go log out here in five seconds, I promise. But now, since I'm using their little playground, I can just be like, okay, run the query. Okay, let's go look at the results. This is an awesome place to be like, I just need to work with the graph API because I'm not using the module for whatever reason. So I can go and work with it here as my proof of concept, bring it into pretty much the exact same style for PowerShell. You see exactly what's listed here. I've got this URI that I'm gonna be doing. I've got this method that I'm gonna be doing. You know how to take that to PowerShell, right? You're just gonna say IRM method and copy straight across. I'm doing a get, get. I'm doing to this URI. Awesome, go do it. Not rocket science, you guys got this. The hardest part is honestly the access token. There's several different modules, even smaller modules that are great for like invoke MG graph. That's a way that you can hit a specific endpoint without having to do all the authentication parts yourself, which is really nice. That helps you go faster. Um, there are times where you're just saying, you know what, I'm trying to pull all this stuff from graph and the module isn't very fast and I don't know how to do it fast by myself. I'm just gonna call out one or two little ways that you can improve that. There's this batching area to go and check out. This is fantastic. If you need to do a bunch of stuff, go look at batching. And there's different ways that companies do batching. You can do stuff like the here, where they're specifying, here's my URL, here's my method that I'm doing, and here's my ID. Microsoft says, you know what? I can make this really, really complex, and I can, oh, there's not a lot of room here. Can I get more room? I can get a little bit more room, okay. Um, Microsoft says, hey, you can put all this stuff in. You can do a post request in this one single request, in addition to also doing get requests. You can put, a bunch of them, you can put like 50 of them all together in one single request and say, hey Microsoft, when you get this, do all of these things. And you can even say with Graph, there's this dependency on, don't even do two if one doesn't work. So you can really save yourself a bunch of calls being like, well, why didn't one of my stuff, well, if one didn't work, two's not gonna work. And it'll respond back. Um, I believe that it has this example response preview that's not very easy to get to. But it will say, hey, these things worked or didn't work. There we go. Nice response. Okay, for the first one that you did, status is 401. We know that's an error. Big problem. Okay, cool. Must be authenticated to use Drive. For number two, oh, look, status, 424. Failed dependency. This is really cool, being able to leverage the idea of, I sent you a bunch of things to get done, and I can go through and iterate through each of them specifically without having to make it be 50 or 100 requests that I'm trying to send through per second. Um, when there's not stuff, the, the Graph Explorer is awesome, except it doesn't have everything. It's just got honestly some of the most common items, which is pretty good, but going to the Microsoft Graph API reference doc is the real place that has everything. This is the stuff that you just need to get used to. This is, this is consuming the API at its most raw form, I'll say. This is the great stuff. This is what really is going to make you able to consume any API is when you can go to their API docs and you can read them, you can understand it and turn it into PowerShell. And so they've got some nice stuff that says, here's how to use it, but you know, you're gonna just be like, I'm working on education. I'm gonna go into these assignments. 
and I'm going to be working on publishing assignments and I'm going to want to list assignment resources, something like that. Come into here, look at it, and it's like, hey, this isn't too bad. I actually already know what I'm seeing here. Oh, if you can, let me zoom it in. Is that, is that readable? At least that part? What do we see? Same stuff we had before, get and a URI. Well, this one is just a partial. But the first part is api.microsoft, whatever it is. This isn't all that scary. It's just the same thing we've already seen in all of the other API docs. Method, URI, cool. Optional query parameters, those aren't scary either. We know how to do that. Top, filter, order by, cool. Request headers, yep, we know how to work with that. We've done that before here in PowerShell. I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna say authentication scheme, bearer, token, Boom, put my token in, or use invoke MG graph to skip that part entirely. Um, okay. Man, I still have so much stuff to talk about. Oh, five minutes left. What are we gonna do? I think, go ahead, what's your question? So what if, you, uh, what if there is not a published API? Like you know that there's one there, but they, the doc documents are published. So the question is, what do you do when there's not an API doc? How do you deal with that? That is security by obscurity. They're making it hard for themselves, mostly, if they're trying to tell you to use it. Now, you can use some stuff to help fuzz it, but really it's just gonna be trial and error. Until you get an API doc, that's your map of how to get things in. Without it, you're just gonna have to guess. Use some intuition. Web developer tools in the browser are a great way. You can go and look at, hey, it works in the UI, I just don't know how to do it on PowerShell. Okay, I'm gonna open up developer tools, go to that network tab, and I'm gonna click on this thing and look at the request that happens. It specifies the response headers, it specifies the request headers, the body, whatever else you needed on it, and take it through. Postman is a great tool. It's fantastic for exploring and working with these APIs, especially when they have an API doc that you can go and if you're using the web browser, um, you might be able to click on launch Postman and interact with the API live or just for, hey, I need to go and try a couple of different ways of getting to this API and then it can save them as resources that are like shortcuts, quick references of what was that thing that I did? Okay, yeah, I've got it saved over here, very nice. Now, I'll remind you that when working with APIs, they kind of give us the middle finger because every company does something different. They don't really believe in all standardizing and you can't force every company to do the same thing. But with PowerShell, we don't have to give up. We can just say, we will tame it all. It doesn't really matter. And I'm just gonna have to end it there. I'm so sad. We've got this whole next segment talking about AI working with APIs. There is some really cool stuff that is going on. Um, I just took this Swagger doc, we've got, yeah, we got two minutes, plenty of time. Okay, I took the Swagger doc that I created right here, and I said, what if, what if I just gave this doc to ChatGPT and asked it questions about it? Okay, yeah, I've got this lab schema right here, you can look at it and you can open it and this is something that all of you can see. It's nothing real fancy, it's just a doc. I can take this, I can go to chat.openai.com, I can say here is an API doc. And it's gonna look at that whole thing and it's gonna say yeah, yeah, it does look like an API doc, doesn't it? Here's all the stuff that it can do. And I can do something, there's so many different things, like I can just say, get me a dinosaur. That's not a lot of context, is it? Oh yeah, but look at that, summit.dcrich.net slash API slash dinosaur. If response equals 200, look at this. This thing can read the API doc just as well as I can. Give me an example of using all endpoints. Great, what's that look like? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. 
dinosaur, API request, user password, does authentication, user key, does an API key, user bearer, does a bearer token, API account, got the stuff, quote, does it. Do you think that's coming in the future? Yeah, yeah, I promise it is. I don't know what that's going to look like, I imagine that maybe we're going to hit a future where we've just got all the companies with all their products listed in a repo that has all their open API specs. And we just go to Copilot or ChatGPT and say, hey, I need to get a list of customers from my call center software. And it can go and be like, okay, your call center software is this, here's their API spec, here's the appropriate endpoint that's gonna have that data, I just need your uh, access token. Okay, here's the data that you want. Does that seem real possible? Imagine if you've got that repository of different companies, you could say, hey, um, give me a list of seats where they're active in the call center, but they're disabled in Microsoft. Show me those people. Okay, yeah, I can read the API spec, I can read the API spec, pull the stuff, collate, put together, yep, here's the people that you're paying for extra seats that you don't need to be doing. That's definitely coming down the pipeline. Well, maybe not, I don't know, I can't predict the future, but if you're someone that understands how APIs work, you're gonna be like someone who's a professional Googler right now. Your Googles produce better results than the average person for technical things. It's gonna be the same thing with AI. Learning to work with AI to do API related tasks is gonna make you faster. Honestly, it's gonna help you to get things done quicker so that you can keep getting those big bucks or get bigger bucks. Is auto rest an example? An auto rest, well, it depends on the context, but uh, we're not bashing on the Microsoft module at this session. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a good example. Auto rest is a good example of. <laughs> yes, creating a module that's useful, especially with using training data, but also the backside of, hey, does this make sense? Does this work? Self-correcting, that is totally within the realm of doable. All of these things are doable. Like, I mean, you could have all of that. Oh, there's, there's a lot more, but I'll have to end it. We are over time. Thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great rest of the conference.